And now for a discussion on the importance of miles and points as travel recovers, please welcome the Vice President of Loyalty at American Airlines, Rick Eliason, and the SVP of Global Brands, Loyalty and Insights at Hyatt, Amy Weinberg, in conversation with Skift Hospitality reporter, Cameron Spirits. Hey, Amy and Rick and everyone tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Let's jump right in, if you don't mind. Um, our chat here today is about how miles and points matter as travel recovers. Um, Rick, I want to start with you because Americans last month showed a way not many of us probably would have thought miles and points to matter in the recovery. We all use the advantage of the program to refinance with the uh, treasury loans taken out during the pandemic and uh, a couple of other airlines did that as well. Can you start us off with elaborating a bit on how this program has helped the airline hopefully get to the other side of, um, of the pandemic? If you don't have Rick with us. Um, I'm not sure he can yeah. hear us. Yeah, I don't think he can. Well, Amy, I mean, while we're waiting for Rick to get back here, um, I, I was just kind of curious. I mean, it does seem like this is more of an airline-led trend during the pandemic, but I mean, financial borrowing power of the hotel loans program, like World Hyatt, I mean, is this something y'all ever considered even during the pandemic? Or, I mean, looking ahead to growth opportunities, um, I'm just curious if, if the loans program can have a little bit more weight. Yeah, I think, you know, loyalty is about relationships and you can use loyalty in, in many ways. Um, if I'm hearing the question correctly, the idea of leveraging loyalty and borrowing power, you're right, airlines have done that very differently um, during this pandemic than we have um, across the board in, in hotels. But loyalty is the, at the core of what we do because again, as an organization that's grounded in caring for people so they can be the their best, we can really make sure that we're leaning in in all ways um, through those relationships with our owners, which is one of the ways that we definitely bring loyalty to bear and very importantly for our members and guests. Great, great. Rick, do we have you back? Rick, are you back? All right, <laughs> Amy, we're gonna continue <laughs> on. Um, we'll, we'll get Rick in uh, sooner or later. So one thing throughout the whole program, we have mentioned partnerships and World of Hyatt has several partners, American being one of them. Um, has the last year, I mean, have you looked at any of those partnerships and involved any of those just to kind of account for the leisure led recovery that we're seeing most right now? It's a, it's a great question. And um, we're very happy um, to have such a strong relationship with American um, through American Advantage, but also as an organization. We've done a number of things in the last year together. In the space of leisure specifically, um, there's a couple of things that I would point to that are a result of um, where American was adding flights into the Caribbean and into Cancun. And we leaned in with a thousand miles that could be earned when staying at a Hyatt Ziva or Zolara. So a great opportunity to take the base relationship that we have, right? And the strong relationship that we have and really lean into um, who was traveling, where they were traveling to and that leisure market, as you mentioned. Um, you know, we, we activated that in November, it went through the end of March. And I'm also happy to say that, you know, last week we put into market also where um, those members that have linked their accounts and are, are taking advantage of a great relationship can earn a thousand bonus miles for every night in our hotels um, from April 15th until um, July 31st. So I think unique ways of leaning into leisure, but also the current times and, and borrowing from the great relationship and foundation that we have um, in our strategic alliance. Great. Rick, can you hear me now? I sure can. Yeah. Thanks, Cameron. Great. I just take every opportunity to create an object lesson for why travel is, is still important, still relevant today. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Rick, I want to bring you in here. I mean, we're talking about the leisure led recovery at the moment. So, I mean, how about with advantage? How is American quartering, courting, excuse me, a market that maybe is dominated right now by people who typically only fly once or twice a year? Uh, well, that is increasingly true, but it's also true that folks who 
uh, you know, we think of leisure and business as, as distinct, and yet in often cases, it's the same person just traveling for a different reason. So even while many corporations or corporate travel policy may not be supporting travel, those same individuals are traveling to go see family, to go to Florida, to go to the beach, or to go to the mountains and go skiing. Like it's in, in many cases, it's the same person just traveling for a different reason. And that's the sort of place where, uh, you know, having a program whose goal is to engage customers over the long term is helpful. You, you, you focus on the customer, not just, you know, their, their mission, you know, not just the reason they're why they're traveling that day. So, so we've done things, of course, like reducing thresholds to help people, ex extending status, reducing thresholds for new people. Uh, we've also changed kind of the orientation of some of our programs or some of our products. For example, if it used to be that if you were buying the least expensive fares, that you wouldn't get all the benefits afforded to you by your status with the airline. We flip that to be very customer centric to say, regardless of your reason, regardless of the fare product you're on, I'm going to recognize and, and make all those uh, those features or those amenities available to you. Again, focus on the individual. Uh, there's also things like in you know in, in, in you know uh, Amy will know this if she hasn't mentioned already, but we've coordinated with Hyatt, for example, to get our GBAC Star uh, cleanliness and training accreditation. That's the sort of thing in recognition that the customers traveling today have a different priority or interest. Safety has always been paramount, but that's, that safety now extends to cleanliness. And so what lengths are you going to help, to help customers feel comfortable that you're taking that seriously? And so those sort of accreditations, and that's something that Hyatt's done as well. We, we, and uh, we, we, we both moved into that space together. Certainly. One thing I wanted to follow up on, though, is it, it does sound like there's a little bit more um, emphasis on, say, base tier loyalty um, as a result of this. Can you elaborate? I mean, like, why was some of the base tier benefits, why, were, why was that abandoned in the years before the pandemic? And I mean, is this maybe a lesson to hold on to this for the long term um, since leisure travel has been pretty reliable um, in certain areas through, through this crisis? Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know what will make sense in the long term or, 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 you know, well down the road. But just as you describe, I think that's exactly right, that in an environment where your capacity constrained, I think people often view the, the biggest lever of getting more from the passengers you've got. Like if flights are full, I'm, I'm not going to it's not volume, it's rate. Right. So people tend to focus on your most valuable customers and uh, see, extracting or, or maximizing value from the top. This is a very different environment where there is available capacity. American, you know, all our planes will be in service next month. Uh, other, for others, they're ramping up very quickly as well. There will be a lot more capacity out there. In these sorts of times, I think it's been a good reminder of growth from the bottom is, is, is the right approach. So it's not just the leisure orientation, but it's the less frequent passengers and, and, and that's where partnerships and having an, a, a broad ecosystem really comes to uh, is powerful or comes to bear because it's not just when they're traveling with you. It's every time they engage with your brand, whether it's as part of the travel journey or it's everyday shopping. It, it, in our case, we've just added uh, H&R Block as a partner in time for for tax season. We've also changed some of the benefits, as you described, Cameron, we've changed some of the benefits for for base members. So we changed our boarding. The boarding process is another one of those things like cleanliness has taken on greater meaning or significance for customers during this period. And so we've uh, added uh, priority boarding for anyone who's an Advantage member. So if you're already getting group one, group two, that's still true, but all Advantage members now get priority boarding. And that's the sort of thing that helps us to change the dialogue with customers that it's not just about the aspirational mile, it's about real tangible and immediate benefits you get mm -hmm. by virtue of your relationship with, with the airline. Great. So, so um, I'm gonna change that schedule rewards to really focus on more immediate benefits. Great. We have um, the results from an audience poll ready to go. Uh, and it was about how do you get, what would make someone consider changing loyalty programs? And it looks like uh, more ways to earn points actually just got them most and are actually tied with more um, base tier benefits. It sounds like you're on the right track, uh, transferable status um, right there. And then um, no one said that uh, I, I would, they would never change their loyalty program. So um, Amy, I want to start with you in this 
next section is, I mean, is it going to be like the Wild West coming out of here of trying to get people to convert loyalty programs, um, especially as travel recovers? Because earlier we were talking to Peggy from Merritt Bonvoy. It sounds like there's a lot of just kind of effort to court new people into that system. So could you elaborate maybe a little bit of a, like, give us a peek of like what Hyatt is doing to maybe court new members, especially as more people get out to getting to the friendly skies, getting on the open road to stay in a hotel, thing like that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the reality is people participate often in more than one program. Um, if we look at history, and that's probably going to be true in the future as well. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. But I think the growth and leaning into the needs, Rick mentioned a few of those, right, that might be higher needs in leisure. I think in the last session, there were some conversations around contactless perhaps being a bit more of a need among business travelers, right, than it is among leisure travelers who may have less occasion. So with that growth, you look at opportunities to engage in where people are. And, you know, we're grounded in listening. If you think about bringing work from Hyatt to life for us and how that's expanded and changed. Rick mentioned earlier beaches and mountains. People want to be in different places. Well, the insight for us and the opportunity came to reward um, members for their workcation, maybe, but really that they could relocate and they could work from a Hyatt hotel. They could earn currency um, and, and World of Hyatt points, but they could also have qualifying nights to help them have those benefits when they're traveling in the future. We have the great relocate, you could move for a whole month, right, in parts of the world. And we have hundreds of hotels that are welcoming people in in a non-traditional stay occasion, I guess, right, given the times. And all of these are opportunities to meet new members, but also embrace the members that we know and love well. So um, I think you're gonna continue to see the meeting of needs stay central, right? Which is essentially what we hear. Loyalty comes from being in a relationship and being able to bring value to that. And that doesn't just come through points. It comes through many things, including the service provided um, in all of our properties around the world. Great. Um, Rick, I want to jump back to where we were starting uh, at, at the top of this conversation. And I mean, the point of our chat is about how miles and points matter as travel recovers. And um, I, I think the airlines have maybe shown a new way during the pandemic, and that's um, basically leveraging your loyalty program to refinance some of the loans taken out during the pandemic. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that of how your loyalty program has really helped the airline essentially get to the other side of the pandemic from, from a financial measure? Sure. I mean, it, it, it's, so I will say uh, there's always been a recognition of the value that the loyalty program has for the airline and the criticality of it. I think this is just as you describe, it's the financial markets or it's really having a, a, a financial, the financial technology, if you will, the vehicle to monetize that. So that's been a, a real boon. In American's case, you alluded to, you know, we just raised $10 billion against the, against the program. I'll call that an endorsement that even in, uh, even in times where demand wanes, people recognize the, the, the criticality and the value that these programs bring to the airline. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a good endorsement and a good reminder to continue investing in these programs and keep them, keep them healthy. Great, great. Um, Amy, going back, you mentioned um, work from Hyatt, and I know there are a number of new ways to earn and spend loyalty points, like work from hotel packages, kind of across the industry. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight of how many people are actually responding to these initiatives? And I, I know there's some debate in the real estate world of how many people are actually going to like tap into this rather than just work, continue to work from home, go back to their office. So we'd love to a little bit more of how, how much of a success that has been you know it's been tremendous so it started out for us in you know maybe a hundred hotels and now if you look around the world you'll see offerings in all regions they were a little different in how they came to market so you know andas mayakoba for example has seen a lot of people enjoying the beach um, as they're working from hyatt but we also see lots of traffic into Grand Hyatt Vale, as an example, 
because again, the mountains are where somebody wants to be as they're um, relocating. I would say that um, the traction, whether it's officing for the day and having another opportunity when you may not be traveling to have some space perhaps for a big series of interviews or something like that, um, and some some extra space take advantage of what the hotel has as well, be that the pool or being able to work out, um, you know, all in, in your day. That expansion proves to me um, the demand is there. And the last thing I would say is there's a lot of data coming out of Google and other places around workcations and staycations and how that's really growing in search. So we see um, the behaviors both in the travelers that are looking for it, but also in the return in our hotels um, and the, the number of members that are taking advantage of work from Hyatt. Great. Rick, I have an audience question for you. Um, someone wants to know, will American change tier status and does the notion of a paid tier resonate with y'all? Seems like we, we might, have, have. might have lost Rick again. Um, I, I tell you what, Amy, um, you know, I, I had kind of the same question for you is, I mean, given what we've heard. No, no, I, no, I'm with you. So, uh, so I think that uh, people tend to value things more that they have to put effort into, right? If I, if I look at the picture on my lock screen, it's a picture of my kids. Well, the reason, one of the reasons I love my kids so much is because they require work. Uh, those are things you create an attachment to. So I think just throwing money at the problem doesn't doesn't solve the objective, which is to promote engagement and have a program that both meets the needs of customers and creates a stickiness to the brand. So I don't think it's likely to be as effective as a program that you have to earn the old fashioned way. Great. Any are y'all I mean, given what we've heard, are y'all looking at anything in the subscription paid loyalty tier space? So I think I would echo um, an element of what Rick just mentioned, right? Which is experiencing what it is that you're earning is important in long-term relationships. Again, you don't buy your way into friendship any more than you would buy your way, I think, into some of the, you know, our program or Rick's from what he's saying, right? So really looking at um, ways to truly embrace people through experiences um, and helping them be the best that they can be is is core to what World of Hyatt is. And um, I wouldn't see that coming through a purchase, an individual, you know, subscription, if you will. Got it. Um, we have quite a few audience questions coming in now. Uh, this can go for both of y'all. Are you seeing a need to further extend elite status for high frequency travelers that have not yet returned? I'll start. Um, you know, we keep our eye on a lot of things. Um, throughout this pandemic, the um, restrictions that are placed on travelers being a, a big one and the availability of, of travel um, to them, given uh, that is how one earns their status. We also have looked at and are um, creating opportunities, right, to achieve qualifying nights, as we've talked about, um, and also leaning in in the U.S. through our um, World of Hyatt credit card as other ways that one can maintain their status. So we'll always keep our eyes on the trends and the availability of travel to our elite members um, because we know that their status is important to them. Um, and so you've seen us move very early. We moved in all of Asia when we made a decision in, in early 2020. Um, and so we'll continue to keep our eye on that and sort of making sure that we're embracing the relationships we have with our members appropriately based on the opportunities to travel. Great, Rick, did you wanna hop in on that one? Oh, I'll, I'll, um, I think that uh, forecasting the future, if, if 2020 taught us nothing else, hopefully it's the futility of that and the importance of being adaptive to, to, the, to the changing needs or environment that you're in. And so, I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I'll say nothing is ever off the table and whether or not we need to adjust uh, elite qualifying criteria going forward, it could be, we'll wait and see. It's, uh, you know, all signs look good in terms of the recovery of demand. I'll tell you when travel restrictions ease for a given country, we see demand take off, it's, it's on a spring. Um, but how that will translate 
in the frequency of travel and ultimately in the business travel, I still think is an open question and, and uh, we will wait and see. No, I think nothing's off the table, but no promises either. Great. Well, I'm getting the ping that our time is up. So thank you both so much for joining us. Appreciate it. And uh, enjoy the rest of the, of the summit. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Great. Thank you.